Okay, we're now up to the second part of chapter two. And as I mentioned in the first part of chapter two, um, the math kind of gets expansive. It's, it's hard to fit it all on the board that I usually work on. So I'm gonna do it here on pencil and paper. Hopefully, hopefully this is, uh, makes sense and hopefully you're able to see the video pretty well. Um, what we're doing now is we're taking the production possibilities frontiers that we had from earlier and we're putting them, uh, we're putting two countries or two firms into the mix. Um, and what production possibilities frontiers basically suggest is imagine if you put, you know, a representative amount of labor, you know, maybe 10 units of labor in each of these places and then gave them a representative amount of capital, natural resources, and entrepreneurship, what would they be able to produce? Um, the, the higher these numbers are, the more productive that country is at producing whatever the good is that we're talking about. So what this could tell me here in this example is, um, if we level the playing field between these two countries, China could produce 10 pills or 10 shirts, the US could produce 12 pills or six shirts, and then there's some bundles in between here on what is supposed to be a straight line um, between the two maximum values. I chose these goods because China produces a lot of things like shirts, a lot of uh, fairly cheap manufactured goods. The US produces a lot of uh, medical gear and um, medical uh, services and goods such as um, surgeries, um, medical research, and as simple as things like pills, right? Uh, medicines that you would take. Um, so these are the two countries that we have. We need to introduce a couple of terms here first. And uh, you should always be taking these notes along with me. So, you know, if you need to pause the video and uh, draw these down, that's, that's a good idea for sure. Okay. Absolute advantage. Absolute advantage is a simple... Uh, a simple concept that is uh, probably the easiest thing we're going to cover all semester. Absolute advantage is simply the ability to produce more. The ability to produce more of a good or service. Um, so in this case, to figure out who has the absolute advantage, you simply just look at who can produce more. So. Uh, China could produce 10 shirts, the U.S. could only produce 6, so the absolute advantage for shirts goes to China, and then the absolute advantage for pills, in this case, goes to the U.S. So that simply means that they're able to produce more, the U.S. is able to produce more pills than China. That's the absolute advantage. Um, it's incredibly simple. Uh, so if I ask it on a quiz or exam, I, I hope that everybody gets that right. Uh, a lot of people want to focus on absolute advantage, and a lot of people uh, think absolute advantage is occurring when they don't really know, uh, they don't really have enough information to know that. Um, a lot of times I hear people talk about, you know, the U.S. isn't producing some good. You know, the U.S. isn't producing clothing anymore, so the U.S. must not be good at producing clothing. Um, if the U.S. is not producing clothing, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have the absolute advantage. And that's what you're going to see in this lesson today. All right, so absolute advantage is simple. The other uh, form of advantage is actually the one that's more important, comparative advantage. And comparative advantage is the ability to produce at a lower opportunity cost. The ability to produce at a lower opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is what you have to give up to produce something. So low is good, right? A cost, anytime a cost is low, that's a good thing. So the country that can produce at a lower opportunity cost has a relative, like sort of a relative capability of producing that good. This is not anymore thinking about which country is necessarily better at producing the goods, but which one is relatively good at producing it. It's kind of like saying, which country is better at producing pills compared to shirts, not just in general, okay? So what are we gonna need to do to solve for comparative advantage? Well, we're gonna have to figure out the opportunity cost, okay? So that means we're gonna have to do some math. In this case, the math is pretty simple. All right, what you can do is set those maximum values equal like we uh, did in part one. 
And what you should get is the following. And this is how I like to set this up um, because this is going to give me all the information I need to solve for comparative advantage. All right, so I'm going to do it for both China and the U.S. And if you're wondering, um, you know, why did I, why am I solving for one shirt and one pill? Well, that's just a really good way to do it. If you're solving for one unit, it makes it a lot easier to directly compare between the two countries. Okay, so starting uh, first with China. China's numbers are really easy, so this is going to be no problem at all. 10 to 10 relationship, so a one to one relationship between these two goods. What that means is every time they produce a shirt, they give up a pill and vice versa. It's a one to one relationship. So this is one and this is one. The opportunity cost of one pill is one shirt, meaning every time they produce one pill, they lose the chance to produce one shirt. Similarly, for the U.S., the opportunity cost of one pill, you should find, is half a shirt, okay? Every time they produce 12 pills, they give up six shirts. So if they produce one pill, they give up half a shirt. Conversely, the opportunity cost of producing one shirt is two pills, okay? Just like that. And so what I can do is I can use that information then to figure out the comparative advantage. So if I'm referring back... To comparative advantage here, okay, that's the ability to produce at a lower opportunity cost. The comparative advantage that we should find is that China has it for shirts because every time they produce a shirt, they only have to give up one pill. Every time the U.S. produces a shirt, it has to give up two pills. Meanwhile, the U.S., we should find, has the comparative advantage in producing pills because every time the U.S. produces a pill, it only has to give up half a shirt. China has to give up one shirt, okay? Now remember, low cost is good, all right? A low cost is a good thing. So, so I've seen students make this mistake. They look at this and they say, oh, half. Half is low, so that's bad. They're bad at producing pills. No, what this is saying is when they produce a pill, they only have to give up half a shirt. So they're relatively good at producing pills in the United States, okay? So that gives me my comparative advantage. Okay, so I'm going to start with a nice clean sheet here. It's got the exact same information on it as before. And uh, I'm just going to circle shirts and pills like that so I remember which one has the comparative advantage. In this case, the absolute advantages and the comparative advantages match up exactly the same. Um, so the U.S. has both the absolute and the comparative advantage in pills. China has it for shirts. Okay. So what I want to try to do next is show uh, that these countries could be better off if they traded. Okay. So let's imagine that if these countries don't do any trading, they're going to produce right in the middle of their production possibilities frontiers. Okay. So they're going to produce uh, five pills and five shirts in China, six pills and three shirts in the U.S. I'm going to label this point A. And A represents production and consumption if they don't trade. Okay. That's production and consumption without trading. And then we're going to try to figure out what they could do if they wanted to trade. And the thing about trading is they're not just going to keep producing the same amount as they would if they were, this is called being an isolationist, okay? If they were isolationists, this is what they would produce, and they're not trading, so they would consume it as well. Um, but the thing is, if they're going to trade, they're going to want to produce more of the good that they're trading away, right? Um, so what China is going to do is they're going to produce more shirts 
and the U.S. is going to produce more pills. Um, there's a name for this sort of activity. Okay, you can put these in your notes here. I'm just—I don't want to run out of space, so uh, I'm just getting a new piece of paper out here. Something called specialization. This is producing more of the good or service for which you have the comparative advantage. Producing more of the good for which you have the comparative advantage. Um, so in this case, what this would mean is since China has a comparative advantage in shirts, See, they're going to produce more shirts. This makes a lot of sense. This is what individuals do. This is what countries do. Um, this is what everybody does, really, if you think about it. Um, you know, I could produce, try to produce a bunch of different stuff, but instead I just focus on economics, just focus on economics, teaching, and research, and then I trade for everything else. Okay, so I'm going to shade towards my direction for what I have a comparative advantage in, just like China does, okay? This is why LeBron James focuses on basketball and is not, you know, mowing lawns and, uh, you know, doing people's taxes and that sort of thing. He's specializing purely in basketball. So they're going to specialize. And let's imagine for this example that they perfectly or completely specialize, meaning they produce only the good for which they have the comparative advantage. Okay. So what I've done here is I've shown China to produce at point B and the U.S. to produce also at point B where they are producing only the good that they have the comparative advantage in. So what B represents is production after specializing, production after specializing before trading. And now after they've specialized, now is when the trading would actually occur. And so what's going to happen is the U.S. is going to trade pills for China's shirts. And in the real world, we're not typically literally trading pills for shirts, that sort of thing. But what happens is people in the U.S. buy shirts in China. Then people in China have U.S. currency, and they go to the U.S. and they buy pills. Okay, so the trade doesn't happen literally like this, but it does end up occurring in a very similar fashion um, after all the dust settles. So what we're going to do is we need to figure out a trade that is going to make these countries better off. And this is kind of the hard part. Okay. So let's create a trade. We know the production amounts. And so let's see if we can make a trade that would work for both of these countries. Let's say that the U.S., trades away five pills for three shirts. Or in other words, looking at it from China's perspective, let's say that China trades three shirts for five pills. Okay, so all we're doing here is we started out with a point imagining where they would be if they didn't do any trading, then we specialized, and now we've set up a trade, and we want to see if this trade would make these countries any better off, okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to label a point C, and the point C represents the consumption all right, after trading. All right, it's no longer showing production, see, because the production already happened. We produced, then we traded, and then after trading, let's see how much we have left. So C represents the consumption after trading. So let's see where this leaves these two countries. Um, the U.S. traded away five pills in order to get three shirts. 
So that would leave the U.S. here at seven pills and three shirts, okay? So they would end up here at seven pills and three shirts. And I'm gonna label that point C. Now let's look at it for China. China traded three shirts for five pills. So they're gonna lose three of these shirts, leaving them with only seven. All right, remember B is what they're producing before trading, right? So they're at 10 shirts, they're trading three of those away. So they're left with seven shirts. In response for those shirts that they traded away, they're going to get five pills, which is here, which will leave China here at point C. What this has allowed these countries to do, and this is the amazing thing of trading, and this is maybe something that's almost obvious, um, trade makes people better off. The U.S. and China, see, if they didn't trade, would be in the middle here, for example, and by trading, it allows them to consume more than what they would be able to produce on their own, okay? And I chose sticking them in here in the middle. It, it really wouldn't matter. I could put them anywhere on this graph and show that they could be better off trading. Um, so if you recall, in the last chapter, we labeled this area out in here beyond the PPF. We labeled it impossible. It's impossible to produce, but after trading, that now becomes possible to consume. And that's what makes trading so advantageous. This is why economists are always so pro-trade. This is why economists usually aren't big fans of things that impede trade, things like tariffs, because trade has the ability to make just about everybody better off. And so the more trading we do, um, generally, uh, the better society can be. So Okay, so let's uh, move on to another example. And this example is going to be a little different. So you can see that we've got these two countries again. But this time I've made it actually what I think is more realistic. I think if we looked at these two countries, what you would see is something more like this. Um, the U.S. can produce 600 pills or 300 shirts. China can produce 100 of either. And so what that means is that the absolute advantage goes to USA for both goods. Now, does that make sense? Is it possible for the US to have the absolute advantage for both goods? Um, yeah, it does make sense. And in fact, it's incredibly common for this sort of thing to happen. Absolute advantage just means the ability to produce more or the ability to be better at producing something. And I think it's likely the U.S. actually has the absolute advantage in producing both of these goods. The reason I think that is the average productivity of U.S. citizens is much higher than the average productivity of the average citizen in China. Um, has to do with the way the economies have set up, their history. Um, the U.S. is a wealthy country and China on a per person basis uh, is not a wealthy country at the moment and that may change over time. Um, so the tempting thing, and, and this is really getting now to what I think is the most important lesson from this and maybe the most important lesson from, from all of economics, is the tempting thing is to look at this and say, well, if the US has the absolute advantage in both, well then they have no reason to trade with China. It's kind of like saying, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you, you know, working with some other students on some uh, math problems and some history problems at the same time. You know, I'm writing a history paper and doing a problem set for a math class, and I'm much better at both of these subjects. The tempting thing then is to think, well, if I'm better at both subjects, there's no way for me to benefit on with trading with these other students. Or if the U.S. is better at producing both goods, there's no reason for the U.S. to trade with China. But that's actually completely wrong. Absolute advantage does not determine trade. Comparative advantage does. Comparative advantage determines trade. 
not absolute advantage. That's a very important thing to understand. And hopefully this little example that we're gonna go through right now will prove that to you. So what we need to do is figure out the comparative advantages. We need to figure out the comparative advantages. So what we need to do is complete those sentences just like we did last time. I'm a big fan of being repetitive uh, when it comes to solving things in math because I think it helps you avoid mistakes. So this is why I like to be so thorough here in writing these out. This is all that I need to solve for this question here. And I've stuck with numbers here that are pretty easy, okay? So these numbers up here are quite easy. Um, what you should find is for China, obviously you've got a one-to-one -one relationship. So the opportunity cost of producing either good is one. Every time they produce a bill, they give up one shirt. For the US, every time they produce a pill, they give up half a shirt. And every time they produce a shirt, they give up two pills. Um, so what that should show you is, um, this example now is starting to look pretty similar to the last one we did. Even though the absolute advantages are different, the comparative advantages are solved uh, in basically the same fashion. So let's go back to our graphs here. Now that we know the comparative advantage, the U.S. has it for pills, China has it for shirts. Again, even though U.S. has absolute advantage in both goods, there still are comparative advantages. Basically what that means is the U.S. is better at producing pills and better at producing shirts, but China is better at producing shirts relative to producing pills compared to the U.S. Let me say that again. China is better at producing shirts compared to producing pills when you compare that to the U.S. That's a complicated way of thinking about things, uh, but it is necessary that you really see that connection, okay? Um, so, in other words, if the U.S. wants to produce a shirt, they got to give up two pills. If China wants to produce a shirt, they only have to give up one pill. That's where that comparative advantage comes from. So let's kind of do like we did last time. Um, I'm going to label point A. All right, and if you're wondering where these numbers that I'm going to put on this graph are coming from, uh, they just come from me playing with the numbers, and you won't be responsible for this sort of thing where you're going in and choosing specific bundles and then setting up the trade. I'll explain what you need to be able to do uh, at the end of this video. So let's say the U.S. can produce 200 of each. That is on the production possibilities frontier. You should be able to prove that that is the case. And let's let China... Um, let's see. I want to make sure I use good numbers here. Yeah, let, let's put China right in the middle here, producing 50 and 50. And let's label that point A. All right, and just like last time, A means production and consumption if they don't do any trading. And the reason I like starting there is that's kind of our comparison. That's what we want to see. We want to see if we can do better than that because that's what they would be doing if they weren't trading with one another. So what, what do we do next? You know, look back to your notes that we just covered and, and check and see what happens next. We need to figure out a way to make these countries better off by trading. And if we're going to make them better off by trading, what we need to do is specialize. Countries need to specialize. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that the U.S., maybe the U.S. ends up producing 300 pills. This is called partial specialization. Um, if they produce only pills, there's, there's not going to be enough shirts to go around, right? If they produce 600 pills, the most shirts the US, that China can produce is only 100. That's probably not going to be enough to satisfy all these consumers in the U.S. So the U.S. is likely to partially specialize, produce more pills, and fewer shirts. And if they do that, that'll lead the U.S. with 300 pills and 150 shirts. Comparatively, China's economy in this example is relatively small, all right? In the real world, these are the two biggest economies on Earth, okay? 
Um, but in this example, pretty small economy, so maybe they perf perfectly specialize here. Completely specialize and only produce shirts. And again, B is the production after specialization before doing any trading. Okay, so that's the production after specialization before trade. We're going to label these points B. And then what do we do next? The next thing we need to do is we need to figure out a trade that's going to make both of these countries better off. So let me see if I can come up with a trade that would work. Let's say the U.S. trades ninety pills for. I got to make sure this trade is going to be uh, good for both of these countries. Let's say they trade ninety pills for seventy shirts. Comparatively, China trades seventy shirts for 90 pills. Okay, and let's see where that leaves these two countries. Okay, so we need to figure out where is point C. We need to see if we can figure out where point C would be on this graph. And again, that's consumption after trading. So the U.S. is producing currently 300 pills and 150 shirts. That's what they're producing before trading. They're going to trade away 90 of those pills, leaving them with 210, in order to get 70 shirts, which would push them up to 220. Looks like that point on the graph would be about right there which is good because that shows they're now outside of the production possibilities frontier. They're now able to consume a bundle that would have been impossible to produce. So they are better off by trading. China, on the other hand, they're here before trading. Okay, so they've specialized in producing only shirts. They are going to trade away 70 of those shirts, leaving them with only 30. Okay, and that may be just what they choose to do with the trading. Um, and then they're going to get 90 pills back, which is way up here. And that's going to lead them to a point also that is outside of the production possibility frontier. So that C represents consumption after trade. And what you're saying yet again is trade makes these countries better off, even though the U.S. is better at producing both of these goods, the U.S. can still benefit from trading with China. The ramifications of this discovery are really quite large. There's a lot that we can learn from this very simple lesson. Okay, so in no particular order here, trade allows us to get more stuff. Trade allows us to get more stuff. Um, this is why economists are so on board with trade. This is incredibly obvious when you think about it on an individual level. So instead of thinking about the U.S. and China, you know, maybe this is me and this is somebody else. Um, by trading, I can get things that there's no way I'd be able to produce on my own, right? I mean, I, I have an automobile, a house, I have internet, I have a... Uh, you know, a huge TV, these things that a lot of Americans have. Um, I got it by trading, right? If you told me, you know, you need to create a car and create internet and you're not going to do any trading, it'd be impossible. But by specializing, I can then trade it and take advantages of other people's comparative advantages um, to benefit. It allows me to consume more than I'd otherwise be able to consume. So that is a huge benefit of trade. A second thing to take away from this is Everyone, or maybe a better way of putting this is every country
can benefit from trading, even if the country that you're discussing is very wealthy or very poor. Okay, and that's kind of what I've saw here in this example here. And you know, I'm making up these numbers. I don't know if this is fact, but in this example, U.S. is more productive at both goods. China is less productive at both goods, and they're still able to make a trade that makes both better off. So it doesn't really matter if you're the wealthiest country or the poorest countries, you can still benefit. And the third one that I think is maybe the, the, the most surprising uh, result here that I think a lot of people have missed, I think a lot of regular, regular Joes in the U.S. don't understand this point here, just because the U.S. or any country is trading for a good, that doesn't mean the U.S. is inferior in producing that good. Just because the U.S. is trading for a good, that doesn't mean the U.S. is inferior in producing that good. So when the U.S. is buying goods from China, which is our biggest trade partner, that doesn't mean China is better at producing those goods. It could be a scenario that is just like this. Likewise, just because the U.S. is producing a good doesn't mean we are better at producing that good. Um, so I, I get very frustrated when I hear people discuss trading and saying things like the U.S. can't compete in the market for, say, clothing. The U.S. absolutely could compete in the market for clothing. It's just not in the U.S.'s best interest to do so. It's also not in the best interest in other countries for them to be competitive and try to produce clothing. We have the comparative advantage in some goods and we don't in others, and that doesn't necessarily align with absolute advantage. Just because you're good at producing something doesn't mean that you should be producing it. Comparative advantage drives trade, not absolute advantage. And then a fourth one here, just to show that it's not all just positives to take away from this, there will be losers in trade. Okay, so think about the U.S. here. Um, initially producing at point A, then producing at point B, trading to get point C. On average, society is better off because we now have more stuff in both countries. So on average, society is better off. But the people that are going to be worse off here are, for example, in the U.S., shirt producers. Shirt producers were producing 200 units if they don't trade. But after trade, they're only producing 150. So if you're one of the producers in this industry, you will be made worse off when trade becomes legal or becomes more prevalent. Conversely, in China, it's the opposite. They were producing uh, pills, and then after trade, they're producing none. They go from producing 50 pills to zero. Um, so if you're one of those pill producers, you're now worse off. That being said, the economy is going to get picked up by producing the other goods. So if we're talking about the fact that the U.S. is losing shirt producers, well, they're gaining pill producers. So what you're going to see is a shift in the labor market. And this is what happens over time um, as the world becomes more uh, trade, trade happy, I guess I could say, as, as the world trades more, as the world becomes flatter, as some would say, um, we're going to continue to take more and more advantage of comparative advantages, and there will be individuals who are worse off. Um, U.S. manufacturing in the U.S., prior to, contra to common belief, U.S. manufacturing is actually up. We're producing more goods, but we are using a lot less labor. So this is actually a pretty good metaphor for that. Um, as manufacturing labor declines in the U.S., services such as entertainment, um, you know, we make a lot of movies in the U.S., we produce a lot of music, things like that, they're going to be hiring more and more labor, and that's going to help to offset the decrease in production and manufacturing. But it, takes, it can take a lot of time. So there are losers in trade, even though society on average is better off. Okay, so what do you need to be able to do for the exam? Well, for the exam, this is the type of question you're going to be seeing. I'm going to give you two graphs like this, 
We heard two countries. And then things I can ask for are the absolute advantages. What country has the absolute advantage in both goods? I can ask for opportunity cost, which is something that uh, you should have done. Um, you should have already gone through in the uh, first part of this chapter. And then I can ask um, who's got the comparative advantage. All right, so absolute advantage, opportunity cost, comparative advantage. Note that this is kind of the crucial step here because I've got to do this before I can figure out the comparative advantage. And then the last thing I would ask for is who should trade what? Okay. Who should trade what? What country should producing, be producing and trading what good? And that's going to come from those comparative advantages. Okay. So absolute advantage is easy to see who can produce more. And then we'll figure out opportunity costs, and that will allow us to figure out comparative advantage, which will allow us to figure out who should be trading what. Simple rule of thumb here is if you've got the comparative advantage, that's what you want to specialize in, and that's what you want to trade. Okay? So that's the things that you should be able to do. Um, let me give you the answers here for comparative advantage, and you see if you find the same thing that I do. So real quickly, let me work through this. So this is, again, this is just for comparative advantage. And what you should find here, if I'm not mistaken, is that Croatia has the comparative advantage in producing cleats. And Belgium has the comparative advantage in producing soccer balls. Um, a quick note. Uh, it's impossible to have the comparative advantage in both. So if Croatia has it in cleats and that's correct, then Belgium must have it in soccer balls. It's possible to have the absolute advantage in both, but not the comparative advantage. Okay, so why don't you see if you can work through that. I'm going to be sending a whole bunch of practice problems for you to work through. Um, please let me know if you have any questions. You really need to be working hard on this. This is pretty tough if you've never seen it before. Um, so I'm going to send out those practice problems uh, with some solutions. And you need to make sure you can do it. Um, I would definitely do that before I took the quiz if I were you. Good luck.